Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret, a hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God. That we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are a folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Do we have the mind of Christ? Do we have the spirit within us? Yes, right. <laughs> Are we spiritual people? Yes. Do we seek to be spiritual people? Yes. <clears throat> so this morning, before we jump into our, our sermon, I'd like for us to dwell on a question and, and we'll do it for just 60 seconds. I'd like for us to ask ourselves, where has God been this past week? Where have you observed God around you? Because if we're spiritual people, we're not just spiritual people here, but if we're spiritual people the other six days of the week, we're spiritual people when we leave here this morning. And we know that God is spirit. Those who worship God worship him in what? Spirit and, spirit and truth. So we're going to take just 60 seconds. Ask yourself the question, where has God been in this past week? You can close your eyes. You can keep your eyes open. Um, I'm going to time us so you're going to see me with my eyes open. Okay. But we'll take just 60 seconds. Where has God been this past week? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We ask for your blessing as we try to discern where you've been working in our lives, in the lives of other people. We ask that we create time in our busy lives to ask ourselves this question. Help us to see as you would have us to see. There's much that we see that seems troubling. 
but we know that you are overall, you are in all, and that ultimately you are in control of the outcome. God, we're thankful for you, for your Son and your Spirit. Let's do them that we pray. Uh, this morning, we are beginning a summer series looking at the Holy Spirit. We've been in the Old Testament. We started in Genesis. We've recently been from Exodus. And so now we are getting into, uh, we're taking a break from that and getting into uh, Acts specifically, but uh, looking kind of topically at the Holy Spirit. Uh, today we're introducing really this series uh, and, and a few things to, to set us up for the rest of the summer. Um, we are going to reintroduce the vision that the elders communicated uh, at the beginning of the year. We are going to uh, kind of introduce uh, specifically what part of that vision we're focusing on, why we chose the Holy Spirit for our summer series, and then we are going to introduce ourselves if we don't already find ourselves familiar with the Holy Spirit, to the Holy Spirit. So to, to remind us of the vision, um, what was presented is that in the next five years, we believe that God is leading us to transform ourselves and our communities through relationships with God and with one another by the Holy Spirit. So we have, as By the Road Church, this mission uh, what, what, you guys have been here a while. What's what's the mission of Philo Road Church? That's right. Love God, love others, and live for Christ. And so this is different from the mission, but it grows out of the mission. This is something that we are trying to be very intentional about. We as a community of believers believe that God is leading us, that God still works, that God still moves. And so this is really an attempt to pick up on that movement, trying to notice where God is going. And sometimes that includes looking at where he's been. Each summer, uh, beginning with this one, we're going to have uh, a topical summer series based off of the section or a phrase in this vision. This year, we're looking to what is probably going to be um, the most elusive, the most mysterious, the most uncomfortable. Can I say all those things to describe the Holy Spirit? Um, I find myself, and when I'm thinking about the Spirit, going to images that we've looked at already, Images like fire, like water, like wind, all of which have elements of it that I can't control. And yet all of these elements, just like the Holy Spirit, have power. And so we look to the very end of this vision, the power of the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit have power? Uh, okay, well, that's good. Uh, what kind of power does the Holy Spirit have? When you think of power, what are, are some synonyms that you think of? Here, here are some that I think of. I think of authority. And the Spirit is of God. God created everything. He has authority, therefore the Spirit has authority. He has influence. The Spirit leads. Sometimes the Spirit leads us in directions we don't want to go. <laughs> but it has influence nonetheless. The Spirit has strength. When we look to Acts, what do we see the Spirit doing? We see the Spirit just taking uh, early Christians to the synagogue, and they go through their normal synagogue stuff, and then they leave, and then he doesn't show up again until the next week. No! <laughs> That's not what we see. We see miracles. We see the Spirit moving in ways that are unexpected. We see reconciliation that is blessed by the Spirit. The Spirit has strength. 
Ability, we could probably throw in there, you know, it, it relates to, to some of these others. It can do all of these things. It has the ability. We see in Scripture um, and in our time that power, generally speaking, is used uh, for better or worse uh, over people. Uh, Genesis chapter 16, verse 6 uh, we see kind of an unfortunate way that power is used. We have Sarai and Hagar, and we see with verse 6, Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. And then what does the rest of that verse say? It says that Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. So we see that power is not always used for good reasons. It's not always used to benefit other people. Is that the case with the Spirit? Does the Spirit ever lord its power over people? Does it ever manipulate people into doing bad things? No. no. The Spirit is from God. God is good. The Holy Spirit leads us to do good. That, I think, makes the spirit a little more trustworthy. Even though it's kind of elusive, even though it's kind of mysterious, we can trust that it's good and going to lead us to do good because it's from God. Now we see this uh, of the in the vision. Um, and this of the is important. Why? Because the Spirit uh, is working alongside, is leading our own spirits. Humans, we have our own spirits. We have our own will. We have our own uh, supposed strength, ability, influence, or authority. But sometimes we think that we can do things that we need God's help for. Sometimes we have this approach to our faith that is, I can do anything that I set my mind to. <laughs> Has anyone ever found themselves in that camp before? Uh, I have, because I'm stubborn. <laughs> and sometimes I think, you know, the text says this, it seems pretty simple, and so I can do it myself. Pull myself up by my own bootstraps and do what God would have me to do. And then, of course, I try it and I fail. I recognize that I have my limits. And so this power that the Holy Spirit has, this power that we have access to that is gifted to us is not something that we can take for ourselves. It's not something that we can overpower the Spirit, wrangle the Spirit, and contain it. But it's a power that we have to be dependent on. And we see, of course, uh, who has this power. And that is the Holy Spirit. This is where the power comes from. But then we ask, who is the Holy Spirit? In the text, uh, we see that, uh, well, rather, we're going to look at uh, ways that the Spirit is described and moving or, or functioning in the Bible uh, as, as we continue in this series. Uh, we are going to see that um, the Spirit does move in unexpected ways. Um, in the text, we see that the Holy Spirit leads individuals to record what they have heard over time, what they have heard from God. And what's recorded is in these different languages, 
in different periods of time. Uh, you know, there's uh, the old joke. I'm telling you a joke so you know when to laugh. Uh, that's, you don't have to know Greek to go to heaven. You just won't be able to talk to anyone when you get there. <laughs> that's not the case, right? Uh, but the Holy Spirit works through different cultures. He works through different periods of time. He works in different ways that might confuse us sometimes. Because our perception of things might be short term. It might be immediate satisfaction. And what the Spirit challenges us to do is think not just of here, not just of now, but to think of ourselves in light of eternity. In light of a period of time that we can't even fathom. There is um, so much that we can know about the Spirit, about God. We, we know that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and His ways are higher than our ways. Um, but there are things that we can look at regarding how the Holy Spirit has been viewed throughout time, uh, whether that's in the text or uh, in light of the text and in light of the ways that people have experienced the Spirit. We are going to explore uh, the promise of the Holy Spirit that is described in the Old Testament. We are going to explore the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're also going to explore uh, immersion's connection with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, you know, if you were raised Church of Christ like I was, then <coughs> as soon as you hear that connection, what verse are you thinking of? Acts. 2.38. Acts 2.38, right? So we'll go there. We'll go in a number of other places. Because when we see the Spirit moving in Acts, when we see the Spirit moving in the Gospel accounts, what we sometimes overlook is that the Spirit is described in the Old Testament. We'll look to the prophets. We'll take passages like John 1, among others, and note that there are comments made about the Old Testament that will include the Spirit. We're going to look at some, some different language you know, throughout history. Um, uh, the Holy Spirit has been included in this doctrine of, of the Trinity, and so we're going to look at some of that language. Uh, what we'll also see is that at some point, uh, the Spirit just started to get ignored. Uh, that at some point, we spent so much time focusing on the sun and imitating the sun that we sometimes put more on ourselves than is humanly possible. And so really what the study is going to be is looking at our dependency on the Spirit. We're going to look at some, some newer history. Now, there, are, there are within uh, stone Campbell Movement uh, churches really for uh, ways that the Spirit has been understood. Um, and there are you know, a couple of ends of this uh, uh, understanding. One that's more, it's called verbal restrictive, it's more word only. The Spirit exists in the Word, it doesn't exist outside of the Word. Uh, that once the text was formed, that's uh, we really didn't need that Holy Spirit anymore. Um, then there's a more spirit-intensive view, which is kind of the opposite end of that. Um, and that's the view where the Spirit, yes, is found in the text, but can also work in some ways that we didn't anticipate. Some ways that make sense in a contemporary setting and a modern setting. And my big issue with that one, even though I believe it, 
my big issue with it uh, is that it does require some things of me that are more than just skin deep. It requires some things of me that make me look inward, that make me look at my attitude. Um, and so this morning, uh, we want to ask for a couple of things. If you would turn to these uh, passages as we're going through them at the bottom of the screen, uh, Zechariah chapter 7, verse 12 will be the first. <clears throat> they made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, a great anger came from the Lord of hosts. I mentioned a moment ago that I have a tendency to be stubborn. Um, I've said before that um, it's not a good characteristic to have, but to some of us, it comes easier than others. Um, but I think that, that whenever we see a phrase, like being hard of heart, that that's really what it's talking about. It's that I'm so unwilling to change my ways, nobody can tell me what to do. I know it. <clears throat> you probably can't relate to that. And then we see even an illustration given in this Zechariah verse that they didn't just make their hearts hard, they made them diamond hard. Now, uh, I don't know, what would that be, geology? A diamond's a rock, right? Is geology the, the study of rocks? Okay. Um, you're helping me learn stuff. Okay. So, diamonds can cut through some stuff, right? Uh, is it just soft stuff or is it hard stuff? Okay. Um, so, we can have hard hearts. And then we can have hearts so hard that they cut through a hard heart. <laughs> Does that make sense? I don't know, that's kind of strangely phrased. So, there's almost like a degree to this stubbornness. And so me, very much being prone to having a hard heart. Could approach my stubbornness as, you know, if, if I have to get into a negotiation with somebody, I'm going to win that negotiation because I'm more stubborn than they are. I don't have just a hard heart, I have a diamond hard heart. My stubbornness cuts through their stubbornness. That's not a good thing. That's not commended in Scripture. We don't get rewards for our stubbornness. And so, one thing that we have to ask for are soft hearts. Just because we have a hard heart, just because we tend to be a little more stubborn, doesn't mean we always have to be stubborn. And I think that this is one of those things that we have to ask for help with. Because really, it's kind of a paradox when we say, okay, I'm going to be less stubborn and do it by my own will. That just seems like a stubborn thing to say. But if we say, God, I know I can be stubborn. I know my heart can be hard. Heart can be hard. And I need your help. I need you to soften my heart. Make me less stubborn. Make me less of a pain. I need help. Another thing, looking at Isaiah 42, <clears throat> verse 1. Behold my servants, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. 
I have put my spirit on, upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Does this sound like anybody in the New Testament? Jesus. Now, okay, where are people who want to imitate Jesus, where people who want to have soft hearts, who want to be shaped into the image of Jesus, who want to be transformed people and not conform to the world around us. What does that look like? If not only Jesus has the Holy Spirit upon him, but if we have the Holy Spirit within ourselves, what does that look like? Does that look like doing justice? Does that look like treating people fairly? Does that look like saying things that are wrong are wrong and things that are right are right? Looking also at Isaiah 11, uh, verses 1 and 2. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. How is the Spirit described here? The Spirit is described as coming from the Lord. The Spirit is described as possessing wisdom and understanding, possessing counsel and might, possessing knowledge and a fear of the Lord. Do we seek any of those things? Do we desire to have any of those things? Do we try to obtain those things? Wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord. Do we ever try to just get those things on our own? Or are these things that we should also say, God, I want your movement in my life. I want to be subject to what you would have me to do, and I want to try to discern Try to listen to that movement. To listen and then to do it. Uh, we, uh, oh, there we go. So, so Paul gives us this invitation uh, to see the unseen. We read this passage to begin this morning. Uh, in this invitation, Paul invites us to look foolish. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I kind of want to. <laughs> I'm not asking if you are foolish. <laughs> I am asking if you're willing to look like a fool. Not just to say, well, I'm a fool. But to look like a fool to a culture around us, to a world around us that is not in tune with the Spirit. To take time out of your week, out of your day, to just listen. Not to have something playing, not to have something distracting us, but to just sit, to just consider, where is God? We are invited to discern. We're invited to, yes, listen, but also to listen to uh, what's getting in the way of our following God. I uh, went to a workshop yesterday in Upper Bloomington, and this workshop included uh, two periods of 20 minutes. And during this 20 minutes, we were to sit in silence. Um, I like sitting in silence. And so for the first 20 minutes, I was happy as a clam. I was sitting there in a circle with a bunch of people I didn't know. No one was talking, which is great because small talk is not my thing. But we had this commitment to listen, 
to God. And so we get past the first 20 minutes, it's great. And then we get into the second 20 minutes. And that was terrible. Because even though we were doing the same thing, I had a much different experience. I had, um, you know, same noises were happening. The birds were still chirping. Uh, bugs were still flying against the window. But as I was trying to listen for God, uh, my mind felt cloudy. Actually, it felt like more than cloudy. It felt kind of like a storm was going on inside. And the really weird part was that my eyes were closed, and I saw these flashes that reminded me of lightning. I thought, okay, what's getting in the way here? Is it? I've had a whole lot to eat. Maybe. Is it because it's light outside? Well, it's light outside, but I didn't have this experience before. And so my question for myself, and I don't know that I have an answer right now, but the question was, why do I have this storm going on in my brain? Why internally do I have this unsettling feeling? Really what that did was it made me ask more questions. Really what it did was it made me write a whole lot down in my handy dandy notebook. For you blues clues like blues clues fans. And it's making me not just try to discern in one moment, but over time I'm going to revisit these questions. Over time I'm going to compare my experience yesterday to future experiences. And that's going to require me to slow down. Paul invites us in a culture that is fast, in a culture in which we have so many things that we could do, what he invites us to is to slow down and to spend time with God. This is a new way of seeing. And the thing with, you know, just as uh, we've grown to learn how to experience life, what to touch, what not to touch, what to look at, what not to look at. What to wear when it's cold outside versus what to wear when it's 90 degrees. Through those experiences we have learned how to experience the world around us. And that's what Paul is inviting us to do. Not necessarily experience the world around us as everyone else does, but in a different way. I would encourage you this morning as an individual, with people here, with other spirit seekers elsewhere, to discern, where is God leading you? Where is God nudging us? And asking yourself the question, am I going to follow him? May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Yeah. Amen.